It's a little after dawn on Loch Summit in the Scottish Highlands on a cold, wet and windy morning in November. But not just anyone, because this particular dawn could actually herald the start of a whole new era in the conservation of cartilaginous species, such as sharks and rays. This tagathon, organised by the Scottish Sea Angling Conservation Network, or SSACN, has attracted the best part of a hundred anglers, both here and at nearby Loch Ateve, with a brief to tag and release as many mature spur dogs as possible, as phase one of an ongoing project to provide hard evidence to take to the fishery ministers of Scotland, Westminster and Europe in their attempt to create the first ever legally protected breeding and nursery area for any cartilaginous species of fish. Anecdotal evidence based on year-round catches of mature fish by anglers from both locks suggests resident populations and therefore the need for specific protection if both populations are to remain viable. This issue has been repeatedly raised by SSACN in meetings with fishery ministers at all levels, with the not unexpected response of, OK, then prove it, give us some hard evidence, and if the science is good, maybe we can do something about it. But turning anecdotal evidence into indisputable fact is no quick or easy task, nor is it cheap. So, partnerships have had to be forged to raise the necessary funds, and to do the science. The UK shark tagging programme have agreed to handle the data, while Scottish Natural Heritage will help in the application for funding on behalf of SSACN to fund a full-time PhD student dealing with this and other aspects of the conservation work. Sea Life Centres are also helping with the finances. Hi, I, I'm Ken Collins from the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton and I ru run the UK shark tagging programme. Basically it's a, it's a bunch of anglers around the UK who when they catch sharks they uh, record various things about them, their size and length and then put a number tag in them and I, I collect all this data together and this uh, study with the spur dog is a new new departure and we and I was very happy to support this this venture because we've got very clear conservation aims and the reason the tagging is so useful is uh, if there is a resident population which if we tag in a concentrated manner in, in this area uh, north of Oban then uh, if they are resident we sh um, very soon we should start to see some of the animals we've tagged come back again and that will give the sort of government folks the, the proof that we are dealing with a local population which really does need uh, special protection. The reason why we believe they're a resident population is because um, we can catch females all year round and with a true migratory species you'd expect them to be in the area for maybe two, three months at the most before they moved on. So just perhaps the conditions are suitable here, the water temperature, feed, uh, to sustain a, a resident population. And uh, you know, it'll, take, it'll take a year, perhaps maybe two years even, to start getting some results back from our um, programmes. But uh, we hope to get the area protected. Um, yeah, I'm here from Southampton University, I'm an undergrad student. I'll be analysing the data um, collected for the first year of the project from November last year up until the end of this month. Um, and I, yeah, as I, as I said, I'll be analysing the data, writing up a report. And Hopefully we'll, we'll be proven there's a, a resident population and get the area protected. The definitive approach will be radio tagging with satellite tracking to get around the frailties of recapture information. But that costs money. A lot of money. And while satellite tagging could well become phase two of the project, simple dart tagging must first establish whether or not that level of expenditure can be justified when eventually the finances become available. You feel it kicking? Yeah, you can yeah. feel it pulling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I saw it there, yeah. yeah. When I first started fishing back in the 1970s, the spur dog was the most abundant small shark species in European waters. I can recall days when we would up anchor and motor for miles just to escape the attention of the spur dog shoals. That's how abundant they were, like a swarm of grey locusts covering vast tracts of the seabed. Then the longliners moved in, 
adding to pressure already coming from other forms of commercial fishing, and in a matter of a few years, they were all but gone. The big problem that cartilaginous species such as sharks and rays have is that unlike fish such as, say, cod, that can lay millions of eggs, and often from quite an early age, recovery times for fish like the spur dog can be painfully slow due to the breeding strategy they employ. Following internal fertilisation, all produce small numbers of well-developed offspring, either live or protected in leathery capsules like this thornback ray, with good survival prospects. And it served them very well, as evidenced by having been successful for around 400 million years. Making a big investment such as this is fine when everything is working in balance. But it's far from fine when a population or a species is pushed to the brink of viability. Female spur dog do not become mature until they're well into the teens. After a pregnancy lasting around 22 months, which is the longest on record anywhere in the animal kingdom, they can produce a litter of up to six live pups, though this figure can be, and often is, down to just a single individual. Little wonder then that when the commercial spur dog fishery reached the point of non-viability, its legacy was a species teetering on the brink of extinction. So much so, that the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Red List of Threatened Species now includes the spur dog, with the rider that the North East Atlantic population in particular which includes the UK, is critically endangered. This has led to calls from various organisations, including the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, to the European Union, to set a zero takeable catch limit for the species. That's how bad the situation has become. Eight pounds? Eight pound four. Eight pound four? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Good guess. Good guess. Yeah. <laughs> what, what bait? bait? Uh, mackerel fillet. Mackerel. Do you know what bottom structure it is, whether it's sandy or reef around here? It's, uh, it's fairly clean because we're, we're not snagging. Interestingly, the fishing, both over the Tagathon weekend and during the exploratory run up to it, in which Ian Burrett put in many hours sussing out the best spur dog holding areas, also saw quite a few common skate put in an appearance. Loch Summer has over the years produced its share of big commons in excess of £200, with a developing pattern that the further up into the loch they are caught, the smaller these individuals become, suggesting the possibility that common skate may also be using the loch as a nursery, and perhaps even a breeding area too. As potential evidence for this, Helen Ewaker from Southampton University, who is responsible for collating and analysing the spur dog data, caught one of the smallest common skate any of us had ever seen. It would have struggled even to make double figures. Other examples, between 40 and 60 pounds, were also taken in the same vicinity. The final stats for the weekend make particularly interesting reading. In terms of support, a total of 85 anglers actually registered, fishing from 12 trail dinghies, two hired self-drives, two kayaks, two charter boats and from the shore, which adds up to a great investment of time and personal expenditure and all in the interest of fish conservation. Approximately 320 spurs were caught and released. Unfortunately, and perhaps a sign of the times, only 24 of them topped the seven pound tagging threshold, the best of which at 21 and a quarter pounds caught by Richard Stanley, beat the standing Scottish record for the species by two pounds six ounces. Biggest overall fish of the event was Paul Spooner's 137 pound common skate, caught and released amazingly from his own one-man kayak.